Hello and welcome to The Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is The Valley Business Today with the SBA Take Two. <laughs> Carl Knotlock, Virginia District Director of the Small Business Administration, is on the Zoom screen with me today. And I feel like, Carl, I need to give everyone listening a little bit of background because you came to town earlier this month in May, Apple Blossom Week, no less. And we recorded a lovely conversation sitting outside at the Daily Buzz in Middletown. And it wasn't until this weekend when I sat down to edit it that I realized there was an audio failure and the equipment didn't work. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but the best part is we get to talk again. Right? So you traveled in, you were here the first week in May, the first Wednesday in May, as you do every single month. And it was National Small Business Week, that particular week that you were here, better known here in our area as Apple Blossom Week. (laughs) So you got quite a bird's eye view of what Apple Blossom looks like in and around our area. But it was a big week for you at the SBA because you had a ton of small businesses that you were honoring and you picked your small business of the year for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yeah, unfortunately, ours did not win. We actually have two district offices to cover Virginia because there's a northern tip, Fairfax, Loudoun County, belongs to D.C.'s district office, and their person won. Ours, MSN Technology, is literally down the road from where the winner is, state winner, and so that was the Richmond district office winner because we covered the rest of the state. Who won for the country? Because don't they all go Uh, into a pool? Yes, it was from Louisiana. One year, I was one of those fortunate ones. I had a national winner. He was a manufacturer, classic manufacturer. He made the wheels on the trains. So he was a heavy manufacturer, but he was a winner. And and, and the thing is, he had a health condition and his thing, because he was in a rural community, he was building a hospital for the community. What? Yeah, that was his goal to give back because the community had been so good to him and everything over the years. We talk about that a lot during our conversations, both on air and off air when we're talking to small businesses, because I think sometimes small business owners get so caught up in running their business and figuring out where their bottom line is and cash flow and all of the things that go into making your business successful, that sometimes being part of your community and giving back and looking at your workers, your customers gets lost in the shuffle. But that's a big qualifier for these awards during Small Business Week. Yes, they really focus on what is being done. Our winner, which is in IT, she has a huge investment in women and girls in STEM. So she just totally puts a lot of energy. And then she's also into dog rescue. So she goes out and rescues dogs. And then she also has a horse farm where she rescues horses. So I like this woman. (laughs) Yes, I know. But you don't hear about that when you're in the day-to-day trenches of the work environment. But this is what they're doing the other hours when they're not thinking about their business. And that's so commendable. Plus, at the same time, having a family and everything else. My hat's off to them. I remember part of our conversation from what we'll call the lost tapes (laughs) was talking about some of the things that maybe you wish small businesses would know before they got started or when they've been in the trenches for a while and are looking to grow. And one of those things was being a bigger part of their community. Yeah, because when you're a part of the community, you get to learn of new opportunities. And at the same time, you're maybe able to help other businesses pursue other opportunities or work together for a common package. As I always tell people, I'd rather have pieces of the pie than trying to get the whole pie because I know I'm going to go hungry trying to chase the whole pie. And that makes a lot of sense. And I think sometimes all small business owners can see is the whole pie. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And they do because they always talk about, I'm going to win this contract and this is what it's going to be. And I'm thinking, okay, and what happens if you don't? or you win it and they cancel it, all those type things. And the thing is, I'd rather get smaller pieces and just be able to enjoy my life and be able to do lots of things because it'll eventually grow out to where I want it to. 
And you do a lot of advice giving and mentoring and just walking businesses through if this, then that. In your day-to-day job, one of the things I joked with you about was the fact that you spend very little time in your office. I always felt guilty bringing you to the Shenandoah Valley from Richmond and you're like, oh, please, I'm never in my office anyway. (laughs) Yeah. As I always tell everyone, you don't get to know the business unless you go see the business. Because I could tell you things on the phone or over a Zoom, but because I really don't get to see your operation and how you run your operation and they people, well, how are you going to see their operation? I said, look, if I walk in and if it's a total mess in there, it's a clear indication that there are certain areas you're going to be having problems because there's dysfunctionality in there. You may be able to find that pile, but none of your other players can. So that means you control everything, which means that there's a hiccup and you're not around. Nobody knows what to do. And so it's trying to get people to understand there are little clues that are given and you don't even have to say anything if I come see you. That's particularly true when you're talking about manufacturing and it's making a comeback. A lot of people are building and making things right here, right now. Yeah, manufacturing is, as I call it, the forgotten art that it's sad that people have forgotten because it has always been one of the best paying jobs in the community, and it's given the most back into communities because that workforce is from there, and then because they're making good money, they do a lot of things for the community. And so having been a manufacturer, I always remember that, and that's why it's special to me. And so when I see people thinking about it, and I say, you should actually start a manufacturing operation so you can actually make that product. Now, I'm going to go overseas and get it made. I said, no, I really need you to understand the potential you have. You're looking at just you. I'm trying to look at your community and beyond. And that's what you have to make a choice with. If you're looking at just you, yes, do that. But if you're looking at your community and beyond, try to make it happen within your own backyard. And that's where you and the SBA in general are such a great resource because we don't know what we don't know. And manufacturing today looks virtually nothing like what it looked like 20 years ago, much less 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's really funny because the day that we met, we're sitting outside of the original Route 11 potato chip location. After a previous one, I went to the actual one in Mount Jackson to see the process. And I was sitting there saying, wow, that is so different from what used to be here. I got to go ask how many employees because our standard for small is 500. And people say, that's not small. And I said, got to remember when the SBA was created back in 1953, 500 was a small operation because you think about all the steel plants, car plants and everything. They had tens of thousands of people working on a day shift. So 500 was a small company or less. Today, 500 is a good sized company because a lot of those companies are 500. They have a lot of robotics and everything else. So I said, it's a huge operation, very different. But I went and asked and they said they had a little over 50 employees. And I thought, well, there's a small operation. There it is. (laughs) And they described how the process works. And I said, that is so cool. I would never thought because when they said potatoes, I thought they were coming from Idaho. And then they explained it. I said, oh, that is so cool. And it's actually very smart how they do it. So it's amazing how people think and make things happen. Rattle of Potato Chips is a really good example, too, and I am working on getting them to do a show with us in the future. But they're a really good example of someone who has 50-ish employees. They outgrew the space that they had here in Middletown. A lot of us were devastated when they left because we liked having them right down the road. But that's what they needed to do to go to the next level. And now you can buy Route 11 potato chips in Martin's grocery stores, at Sheets stores, 7-Elevens. You used to not be able to get them except at your mom and pop shops. Now they've grown and you can get them virtually anywhere. Yeah, and you and I had talked about it because I work for the federal government. We deal a lot with the government contracting side. These would be great and all the commissaries are all across the world. And people would love it from that standpoint. Has anybody talked to them about potentially putting their product line into the base commissaries across the country for our military? Let's take a break. When we come back, mm-hmm. I want to know what you think of businesses here in the Shenandoah Valley that we've been talking to over the last several months and how they compare on a broader spectrum to others across the Commonwealth. Can we do that? Sure can. 
We are on the Zoom wah wah today <laughs> with Carl Knobloch. He is the Virginia District Director of the Small Business Administration. It is the Valley Business today, and we're going to come back in just a couple of minutes. Don't let a cringy DJ ruin your wedding day. Celebrate confidently instead with Summit Events Co., the premier entertainment company in the Shenandoah Valley. Summit Events is serving 200 couples a year with five-star reviewed DJs, photo booths, 360 booths, live music, and more. You can celebrate confidently with Ben Savory, Summit Events founder and chief party officer who was just named the Top of Virginia Entrepreneur of the Year. Don't risk your wedding. Book a professional at summiteventsco.com. That's summiteventsco.com and on Instagram at Summit Events Co. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is the Valley business today with the SBA. Carl Knobloch is on the Zoom screen with me. He is the Virginia District Director for the Small Business Administration. He originally was here a couple of weeks ago during National Small Business Week, but that show just didn't quite work out (laughs) the way that I had hoped. It sounds terrible. Trust me, everyone listening, you'll thank me later that I did not end up airing that show. Carl, when we went to break, we were talking a little bit about manufacturing and small businesses. We were talking about how unique and yet ordinary Route 11 potato chips is in the grand scheme of businesses. How do you think our businesses here in the Shenandoah Valley compare to those that you deal with across the Commonwealth? Are we different? Are we bigger? Are we smaller? Do we have different needs? It's a great question. And a number of of years ago, the Commonwealth of Virginia decided to create Go Virginia. So you have nine districts across the Commonwealth that you're broken up. And they each kind of chose like their market sector focus that they felt that's what that region has and wants to invest in. And there's commonalities throughout. But as you know, Northern Virginia was IT with the data centers and everything else. That's the pipeline of that. And then you get west of the mountains and it's like, okay, what changed? There's so much more manufacturing along the 81 corridor than a lot of people realize. It's such a growth opportunity, but people don't see it that way. They just see it's part of function. The one of the things that really hits me, and I know them many years ago because they were at the forefront was Trex and they're headquartered here in your area. Nobody would ever realize that, but they were at the forefront at the time of what they created. And they continued to create new products from their original idea that kind of disrupted the outdoor decking market and things like that. I give them tons of credit for that. And that's what you want. You want that innovation comes out. You talk about the Route 11. It is a potato chip, but it is really different from a lot of other potato chips. It has its own distinct flavor compared to, I can go get, you know, barbecue potato chips at other places and you eat them and they'll say, yeah, they're similar. There's a little different, but when you eat theirs, there is a distinct difference and it's how they do it. And that's why I talk about that investment. Your region, I see people putting more into the quality, which as I say, drives a higher price, but that's what you pay for. If you want quality, you pay for a higher price. If you don't want quality, you pay a lower price. That's your choice. And that's why I always tell people don't change yourself to get a customer and maybe that you really don't want. And I think that's where a lot of businesses make mistakes. They try to get themselves into a customer that will buy the product and says, look, you make it for the customer you want. And if they buy it, great. If they don't, then you shouldn't have been in the market in the first place when it comes down to it. But that's the thing I look at. They all have the same issues you were talking about earlier about finances, getting money. How do I do certain aspects? How do I find a customer? You know this, you deal with this on a daily basis. You're the expert in that, trying to find that market. Who will buy my product? And what do I have to do to get them to buy my product? That's a big one. Because I always tell everyone, I can give you all the money in the world, but at the end of the day, you'll fail if you don't know who your true customer is. To circle back to community, that's where that comes in. When you're talking about a company that was on the forefront like Trex and the fact that they have now built their international headquarters right here in the city of Winchester, but they also do this really cool thing with nonprofits where they have them collect plastic bags. And if you collect so many pounds of plastic bags and you turn them into Trex, they build you a a bench that you can do something with for your nonprofit to raise funds, to raise awareness. So even a company the size of Trex 
gets community. And that's what you have to keep in mind when you're doing any of this stuff. Yeah, because Trek started out just like everybody else, a small shop, and then eventually grew to where it is. Everybody says, well, SBA, who did you help? Under Armour, they started with us. Apple, they started with us. Nike, they started with us. So what I try to tell people is words that roll off your tongue today start out just like all of you. And it's how it eventually takes off to what it is. People just have to understand that. Yeah, because we all have to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. even if we are taking over a business that's generational, our customers are going to change because we all in life, a fact of life is that we all get older. So our needs and our wants and our desires and all of that changes. But then there's another generation coming in. So while there's another generation taking over a business, that means there's another generation of customers that may or may not be right behind them wanting the same thing or the same thing in a different way. Yeah. And you hit on a really key point as we talk about the different generations from the baby boomers to the Gen Z's. They have their different interests, what they'll invest in, what they'll spend on. And people get frustrated by that. I said, you got to understand if you want that customer, you will sit there and figure out a marketing strategy to get that customer. If you don't want that customer, then don't complain about it. Just focus on your current customer base and understand that customer base is dying out. And eventually you won't have any, and that's okay if that's your exit strategy. I used and to have so many conversations with clients about Twitter in particular, and they would say, oh, my clients, my customers aren't on Twitter. Twitter is for the kids. And while that may be the case, what I tried to get them to understand is that at some point, these kids on Twitter are going to age into being your client. And if they have always used Twitter, they're not just going to stop using Twitter when they turn 30 years old. They're going to continue to use that social media. And if you're not on there, then you're going to lose that entire market of people. Now, Twitter is probably a really bad example, <laughs> given what has happened to it over the last five years. But that's a great example now called X. We're the Small Business Administration. Okay. Now, you would think that us at a local office level that we would have a Facebook account, we would have Instagram accounts and things like that. We have none of that. What do we have? We have X. How many of our small businesses that we are basically trying to get to have X accounts? Right. Yeah. So there's where you talk about not understanding your market set. Fortunately, headquarters has those tools that people can tap into, but at the local level, we're not there yet. Are there trending business types? Are you seeing a bunch of manufacturing or is tech becoming the new in thing? Are there things that appear to be trending in the business world? We go through our phases and I'll use one that's really big in your region. That's craft breweries. They exploded. Now they're on the backside. We're seeing them closing. And that's what I always tell people. It's about the life cycles. Before the craft brewery, if everybody remembers it, it was cupcakes. It exploded and then <laughs> died very quickly. Now nobody mentions a cupcake. And so that's what I talk about. We get these trends and you capitalize on your trend and then understand when that market is changing, what do you do to keep yourself either in that line of work? This is where you are. You're in a mature market. That's where you're going to stay. Or basically it's time to step out and just move on to something else. But manufacturing is one that's a big investment with the Invest in America program with this current administration to create more manufacturing jobs that we build it back here at home where we've kind of let it go because of getting cheaper labor costs. At the end of the day, I, I remember something very well when I was doing manufacturing. I could compete with China with no problem. Price-wise, from making it, I was better. But where I lost was packaging because we as Americans love all our different packages. <laughs> so that drove the cost up because that's labor intensive. And that's where the game changed. Like when I competed against Mexico doing business, they were angry at me because I could do it cheaper, but I was shipping it back to Mexico and I still could make it cheaper than they could in their own backyard. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to tell people. We, as the United States, have always been very competitive. It's those other little in the windows that creates the price shift change. 
and people just have to understand it. Now we're trending where we're becoming, especially with Gen Zers, very environmental friendly. We wanted to make sure that it can go back into the environment, be used again and all that. Guess what's that going to do to packaging costs? It's going to drop it. So how's that work for us in the United States? That works in our favor. And once it becomes the norm, I feel like it gets easier for people that are getting started now. Like every time I get something from Amazon, they make a point of having printed on the box. This is the smallest box that was possible to send this. And this uses less whatever to ship this to you in. And yet I'm getting something teeny tiny in a box that's way too big. I'm still not sure how all that works out. Covered in bubble wrap and plastic in those little air packets. But even still, I guess the air packets are more sustainable and easier to produce than the popcorn. <laughs> well, actually what the cost is, is that if they have that many different sizes boxes around that actually creates dysfunctionality so they only have so many different size boxes and that's what it fits into based on their research on what people order and so the boxes will change over time based on what people are ordering design wise so they keep a certain grouping because that's how that team that's as they call the packagers in the amazon that's how it comes down it tells them what package to get they get it they load it in they don't make a choice. The system tells them everything. Ah, oh, that's good to know. So the next time yeah. I get something in one of those bags that really should have been in a box, I shouldn't yeah. grumble under my breath at the Amazon employees. <laughs> it's actually the system telling what they put in and everything else. Since we've started doing this show together in person and we've been meeting with small businesses, you are all in on following back up with them and talking to them in depth. I mean, while our podcast version of the show usually runs about an hour, you are all in to help, but anybody can do that. They can reach out to you and say, hey, I have a business idea. Hey, I'm struggling with X or Y or Z. You're all in to give them advice, help point them in the right direction. Yeah, it's really fascinating, Jan, because just as we were doing the emergency run of redoing the show and you sent me a thing saying, I'm done a little early if you want to hop on. And I'm on a call at that point with a business, their IT company. But they're one of those rare ones where the guy's actually very experienced in Six Sigma, which ties to manufacturing. And so him and I are talking about it. He says, oh, you truly understand it. And I said, yeah. And I said, so how are you selling it in the IT market? Because I said, I looked at your website, it doesn't connect. And he's sitting here and he's looking at me and I'm describing it. If you did it this way, he says, I've noted that and that's what I'm going to start doing. And so it's that kind of thing of getting people to understand they may have a gold mine sitting there, but they don't see it because they're in the day-to-day -day trenches. And so my role is to try to get them to see beyond that day-to-day -day so they can see potential new opportunities. And it goes back to what you said earlier is I think there's a huge misconception out there among a lot of small businesses. Oh, I'm not big enough for the SBA to pay attention to me. And they forget that at some point, Apple... HP all started in garages or basements and they too were not that big, but utilized the SBA to get to the size that they are now. Look at the Wright brothers. They were a bicycle shop. They created the plane and look what we are today. <laughs> and that didn't take a long period of time, the early 1900s. And you figure by World War II, what were we doing? Right. Yeah. And that was only 40 years. And it could be any kind of an idea. I can't remember specifically now what it was, but I remember when we had our conversation a few weeks ago, I feel like I wanted to make a t-shirt. I feel like there was something I wanted to do. And I say, hey, Carl, you know what we should do? Well, <laughs> oh, it you was, know, I, you know I, what I, you know. should do. That's what it was. <laughs> I, yeah. And we talked about that. This is what you should do. And you were talking from a, a marketing strategy. I said, yeah, that's so right on. But as you talk about t-shirt, are you going to go buy a cheap t-shirt? You're going to buy a quality t-shirt? Or do you want a t-shirt distinction like made out of hemp? And people say hemp. And I said, yeah. I said, unfortunately, the United States doesn't do hemp. But yet a guy can cross the border in Canada and get all the hemp I want to make clothing and things like that. That product is much better than cotton from an environmental standpoint and also from the comfort of the shirt and everything else. And then I said, let's compare it to bamboo. And then let's also compare it to Trex with their bags where we recycle the polyester to make clothing. The list goes on and on. And then if you want to just stamp the shirt, 
which actually material works the best for maintaining it after a certain number of washings. Like we were talking about it and I just got a shirt from L.L. L. Bean and it has material in it so it keeps mosquitoes away. And it's good for 70 washes. And I said, now how do they know that 70 washes later, mosquitoes <laughs> will not come and attack me in this right? shirt? And I'm sitting here thinking, this is so fascinating. Oh yeah. And so here it is. I got a shirt that basically can keep mosquitoes away for 70 washes. So now I'm trying to figure out how to keep tabs. That I know when the 70 wash comes about. You got to put a piece of paper and a little tally sheet on your dryer on the washing machine for every time it goes in. <laughs> or when the mosquitoes start biting me, I said, I guess I used up my quota. Right. Yes. And it's crazy how that sort of stuff evolves. The show that people will get to listen to tomorrow is a community health show that I do every month with Valley Health. And we're talking about May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. So at the end, she's talking about the importance of protection, that you can literally prevent almost every type of skin cancer by wearing sunscreen. And now they make clothing that is UV resistant and hats and shirts and all of these things that have this sunscreen capability built into the actual fibers. Yeah, you're so right. That's what I talk about. That's what's so neat about technology. And it's about experimentation. And that's one thing I don't always say about the United States. They've been able to use their creative minds to create all kinds of unique things. I remember a number of years ago, there was a competition Microsoft was doing with the Urban League. And the kids were allowed to think creatively trying to use technology. And the team I was working with was creating sensors for shirts. And just a few years after that, they were doing it. No idea anymore is too crazy when you do your research. And that's, again, it goes back to that's where you guys come in because you may think it's a crazy idea and don't even know where to start and how to research. Is this even a feasible idea? That's where the SBA website, that's where you come in, our small business development centers, all of the little branches that come out from the SBA are so valuable. Yeah, you point out a, a great point. You have all these resources, and our site, sba.gov, is a great website, and it connects you into your local resources that are available to you. But we have all this research and development money, over $3.5 billion every year that people can compete for to get. And right now, we even have more than that because of the big focus with the Invest in America on renewable technology. So there's all these things. And I was just working with a college student that was doing just a competition for a grade. And now they're trying to spin it out into a company. <laughs> That's great. That's what you love to see, that creativity just running loose. Well, I am excited about next month when you make the trip down in early June. We are going to take a trip over to Mount Jackson, as a matter of fact. Maybe we'll go have potato chips for lunch at yeah. Route 11 and see if we can yeah. catch Sarah there working in the potato chip factory. But we're going to talk to, we have a roundtable of small businesses that Olivia Hilton has pulled together for us and all different types of businesses. So I'm pretty excited to have that conversation next month. Yes, I'm really looking forward to it. Like I said, every show we've done, I've enjoyed it. I enjoy talking to the businesses. And they all have really cool stuff from the auction house. I really love that. And their creativity to our mental health. They all have commonality and they have their unique differences. And that's what makes it so much fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate you, A, making the trip over and then having to still jump on a Zoom and record a radio show anyway. Happy to do it. I will be back tomorrow. As I mentioned, it is Community Health Day, so we are on the Zoom with Dr. Maureen Hill. She is a surgical oncologist with Valley Health based out of Winchester Medical Center. We're going to be talking about skin cancer, things you need to know to prevent it, to treat it. So meet me back here for that just a few minutes after noon.